Okay, good morning. So let's continue from the point we left last time. See, so we had, now we're talking about second, second order equations. Let me quickly revise where we were. Functions of u, ux, well, x, sorry, x, y, u, ux, uy. We have our Cauchy problem on gamma p, b, p meaning the projected part. Excuse me, with now because second order we're giving data. We don't have to find this data. It's given to us. Okay. And I mentioned about problems of uh, sometimes we cannot give this in full generality, right? This like usually it's good the normal condition. From the, from the curve. And this is the place where I sort of stopped. So as before, I don't know if I wrote this in full. Let me write it now. As before, compatibility condition arises. In order, I wrote it, but not maybe in full. In order to find, <coughs> excuse me, from the Cauchy data, higher order derivatives. So I'll just mention, like in the in the sense of. Taylor series expansion, okay? So, okay, so let's differentiate du, this is d is bad, du, which would be dpds, right? This is uxx f prime plus ux prime g prime. We differentiate q with respect to s. Okay, and we consider, right, that these are the same. So let me put it here. Consider smoothness, right, or so the, the, the inter interchange is okay. <coughs> Still have a little bit of my allergic cough, sorry, getting a little better. And then let me put it here so we can see it all together using the initial PDE as I sort of nicknamed it, right? Here's the initial PDE. And these two conditions This right, or P prime. Yeah, I'm writing this wrong. Whoops. 
Sorry. Yes, not good. So this is then the system that we have to solve for our higher order derivatives. All this is in terms of S. Okay, so this is, well, let me put it here as a reminder. All in terms of S, which means with function values on the initial curve gamma, right? With working with Cauchy data. Okay, so therefore, linear system of equations above, which means the previous blackboard, has a solution. Let me put it like this. If this determinant is non-zero. Right, comes from here. A to B, C, F prime, G prime, F prime. Well, I wrote it in the notes differently, right? So let me write as in the notes. It really doesn't matter, right? Well, let me leave it like that. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Right, because in the notes, this is the first equation. Okay, it doesn't matter. No, this is right. I don't know why in the notes I wrote it. Yeah, I don't know why in the notes I wrote it. Either. So therefore, <coughs> this means that A, G prime squared, has to be different from zero, okay? Or else, this is what hap we have. This is what gamma is characteristic. Or gamma P, let's put it. Is not characteristic. And soon, we're going to see that condition, which is the discriminant of some roots, blah, 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 which tells us if the system is elliptic, parabolic, or hyperbolic. OK? <coughs> so here, we're saying it's characteristic in the sense, even though we're not really talking about, right, um, say, a necessarily a hyperbolic system, it's characteristic in the sense that we cannot get the local power series expansion solution nearby. So from this, oh, okay, let, no, facts, which are comments, okay? So A, this is, I think I never wrote this, but I mentioned many times, I just mentioned it now, this is in the spirit of a local power series, Taylor series, right? Expansion, and for maybe Taylor series is better. Taylor series expansion. B, we could continue say by using, let me write it like this, I think you see the spirit <coughs> that is differentiate if if we have enough smoothness, differentiate this being the initial PDE, right, the PDE evaluated on gamma, and then building up systems for higher order derivatives if we want to go further 
in the Taylor series expansion. Okay? And another fact that we will not see in the course, but sometimes I think it's done in the, in the PDs, linear PDs um, course, is facts related to the convergence. And so that you know some names, at one point I mentioned a little bit about this in this course, but I don't want to, I want to put more applications and not repeat too many things. So convergence of series has to do with analyticity of solutions and right existence etc and a famous theorem um, um, connected to this you find this actually in Fritz John is Koshi Kovalevsky theorems which are in the spirit in the spirit of actually what we see in complex variables these are many times appear for elliptic problems anyway you have it in, in, in many PDs books in the spirit a little bit of analytic continuation so how far can you go making estimates for that and so these are the Cauchy Kovalevsky, Kovalevsky theorems right this here as I mentioned for this course is cultural comments, right? So you have heard it once. If you need it, you know where to find it, study it, and so on. And I think in the course here, PDE's linear theory, it's, it's, it's seen in more detail. OK, now let's take this condition here, actually the case equal to 0. And actually, this, if we can even see here, if you sort of divide this, think that f prime is different from 0. Divide this through by f prime. This is a quadratic equation that we know how to solve for the roots. Okay. This is actually dy ds. This is dx ds. If I divide it through, I'm going to get dy dx squared. I'm going to write it down. And you, we find the roots. And the roots are going to tell us when the problem is hyperbolic, elliptic, or parabolic. Okay. We're about to see this. So look at this. So um, the condition, let me write in a different way, for the determinant delta can be written as No, no, I'm going too fast, sorry. It can be written as okay, as I just mentioned, because F is the X, the S, G is the Y, the S, blah, 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 right? And if you can divide through, and if we can divide through, right? Um, yes, I skipped one, one, one step. No, no big deal. So therefore, so you can check these things on your own. Therefore, we have as roots And there, and, and hence, we have the conditions elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic as these are double roots, right? Or let me put it this way. These are real roots. And these are complex roots. Okay, so in this case, I 
of the hyperbolic problem, right? There's, as we saw, there's speeds. Th since they're real, they are speeds, okay? The parabolic, you have double roots, and the elliptic, you have, you have two different roots with uh, an imaginary part. So more facts. Let me put now as one is that a PDE can change type depending on the region. On the region. So here, let, let me put it here. So good. One example is the Tricomi equation. Duyy minus y duxx equal to zero. Okay. In fact, number two, which I already mentioned in the course, but it's good to write. There exists conservations conservation laws of mixed type disappears when application is where disappears is flow in porous medium And what is mixed type? This means is that there are regions elliptic regions usually associated to instabilities. Okay, so as we saw in conservation law, we saw it in the, in the context of uh, hyperbolic problems, so in the context of real eigenvalues or real roots, whatever you want to, the way you want to see it. But then suddenly in a certain region, the eigenvalues or the roots, the characteristics and so on, change type. Actually, they're not real anymore, which are associated to propagation speeds of information, and they become complex, right? And that is associated to um, instabilities, okay? And somehow, just think of this, if I have something that is it e to the la lambda t, for example, if the lambda is real, this is an oscillatory thing, if lambda becomes complex and depending on the sign of the imaginary part, this might grow in time, okay? That's how, I mean, in a very vague way, it's not that simple, right? This becomes then something that grows in time. It is a manifestation of some instability. But again, it doesn't appear in this so simple fashion. Okay. So let's go. Some more comments. So I've been mentioning about, you know, uh, characteristics and things like that as, as um, coordinate systems. So let me do something, again, also quickly, just put this into to, to context. Let's look at the linear case. So take linear second order PDEs. And let me write like this, similar to what we wrote. It's a general linear case. Okay. Where A, B, C, D, E, F, because it's linear, are functions 
x, y. <coughs> now, let, let's do this change of variables. OK? C is some function phi of x, y. C, some function C of x, y. And where, say, C, what's a constant? Is the level curve of this guy. So there's a level curve of this, in this new, I'm going to think, coordinate system. Right, so a level curve is like a coordinate system. So <coughs> if we change variables in, in this coordinate system, the PD reads as LU equal to this. I'm going to have some new coefficients. No big deal. OK, no, I'm not going to write the whole junk. Just big thing, just, you, you just put capital letters, right? Right, and in the notes, right? Well, I actually have to write it. I was going to, no, I have to write it, sorry. I have this. OK, this one is larger. I'm going to skip. That's why I wrote in the notes. But it's important to write that I write A and B. That's why I said, oops, I have to write it. These two I have to write, right? I was going to get lazy and not just say, look at the notes for the expression, but I have to write these two guys. Why? Because I can say, well, OK, I started here, this linear equation. And actually, we're going to soon use one of these facts, but not in this complicated way. We're just trying to do a little more generally, but it's not a big deal. We're going to rewrite the wave equation in the characteristic e form, characteristic coordinates. I already mentioned this many times. But here we could ask the following question. What can I maybe ask to simplify this equation? Can I maybe ask A and B, A and C to be 0? Right? Because that's what we're going to do with the wave equation. But we're not going to do it in this generality. There's because if I ask, if I ask, and this is what you will see just in a few minutes, if I have that a and c are 0, the higher order derivative is just this guy. And if you have this guy, look, if you have this guy, you can think that basically in this characteristic system, if these are characteristics, you can basically think of this almost as, a, as an OD in the sense Right? You just call this V. So you have dV d eta. You integrate in eta. And then you integrate in C. This is exactly what we're going to do next, right? In a very simple case. So can I simplify this PDE and make A and C equal to 0? The question is yes. And that's why I wrote this. I was almost lazy and I was going to skip this. Yes. Because if phi and psi are characteristic coordinates, right? That means if phi and psi satisfy this, boom, I kill, the, I kill 
those two terms. Okay, so so the way it's better said is written in the notes. If phi and psi represent characteristic curves, then <coughs> sorry, a is equal to c is equal to zero. And if b is non-zero, we can divide through and get which, right, this d, e, and f are, of course, new coefficients. And in the case of the wave equation, right, we don't have these guys. Right? This is all going to be 0. We're going to have that this is equal to 0. I'm going to, I'm going to be doing this in just a few minutes. OK? So, OK, that's, this is a nice way to show. Plus, I, can do, I have one more step to do. Unfortunately, I have to go over here. But it's one, one, one way to show that we can sort of normalize a PDE, a linear PDE, into looking like our standard wave equation. And why is that good? Because our standard wave equation, in principle, at least as the leading order terms, we know how to solve. Analytically, we know how domain of dependence is and so on. So. Let me write this. Now, if we set now a new coordinate system, which is x prime and y prime like this, we get a normalized wave equation, that means a wave equation with normalized speed, like this. Okay, so you see that these are lower the terms, but here you have normalized the speed to plus or minus one. Remember in the last class, I think we also using tricks of uh, the 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 travel time and so and so. We also can sort of normalize the characteristics in some in some cases. This is this is useful, right? Because we can go to something to a grid like this if you want to do numerics. OK, so instead of over there, we had variable coefficients. So the speeds were variable. Okay. Can we do something similar for the elliptic problem? Well, yes, we can. But it's not going to be, life is not going to be so easy. So in the elliptic case, can we reduce say to a Laplace sort of looking equation
In other words, getting um, an equation, let me write like this, in the form To obtain this, we need to impose. Now that not that a is equal to c equal to zero, but a is just equal to c and b is equal to zero. Well, life is not going to be so easy because this leads, in that case, imposing a equal to 0 and b in c equal to 0 was already, we already knew. It was the, dis, the discriminant, right? the, the determinant, sorry, equal to 0, right? But now, if you want to make a equal to c and b equal to 0, this leads to the conditions. that phi x is equal to this. Phi y is equal to this. Where this w is that discriminant. And let me use the space here. Eliminating phi one gets sort of a well known equation, gets the Beltrami equation. So still a difficult, still a difficult problem, okay? But anyway, leading to other interesting PDs, okay? So very good. So now we reach an easy part, but a very instructive part, which is the famous, well-known d'Alembert solutions for the wave equation, right? As you as you will see, all these ingredients come in but in a very simple, much simpler fashion, okay? Using, say, chord characteristic coordinate systems, blah, 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 anyway. So this now is pretty simple, but very instructive. Wave equation and D'Alembert solution. <clears throat> so look at this problem. And we have 
two initial conditions. Okay, and for we learned this as an undergraduate. I think most people do at least using separation of variables as the problem of the vibrating string, right? So you have a this. Okay, so if you have the problem of the vibrating string, this means that you have boundary conditions. U say of zero, T is zero. U of L, T is zero, which means the extremes of the string are fixed at all times, right? Um, U. Of xt is this vertical displacement of the vibrating string. <coughs> in many, in water waves, for example, in many cases of waves, but in particular water waves, a wave like this is called a a um, a, a standing wave. It just goes up and down. That's not propagating. Okay, so it's a standing wave. And now, um, what does this say? This is the initial displacement. Right? So and this is the initial speed. So usually when we play, say, a guitar, whatever, we pull the string and we let it go. So G is zero. Right? But if you get a string, so you're playing with a rope with some friend. And it's very, very nice as a kid, right? You get a rope. I think I did this usually with, with a hose for water, right? You go like this, boom, and you see that wave moving to the other end, right? So you're giving it initial displacement and initial speed also, right? Because you pull it and boom, you go like this, you give it initial speed and you see that wave propagate, right? But usually the hose, if it's a rope, sometimes it's not, it's loose on the other, on the other end. So here it's fixed. So how do we solve this problem? It's a very simple problem, okay? So usually, <coughs> excuse me, when we solve this, at least me, when I learned this for the first time, right, this was solved first time. So as an undergraduate, solved by separation, of variables, which will appear here in some sense, separation of Fourier, right, Fourier sort of series. In cosines or sines, that's easy, in sines, because we want it to be zero here at the extreme that's zero, and say at L, it's a sine of period L, okay? So Fourier sine series. Okay. Now here, and you know, as many things in the course I, I do sometimes, either I skip something because it's in the notes, or I sip, skip something because it's easy, and it's like a, an exercise for whoever right, is, is watching. So here is the steps. With C equal to X plus C T and eta equals to X minus C T, we saw this, right? This means that the wave equation becomes this. Okay? Which is, as I mentioned before, I'm writing like this. which is a quote-unquote an OD, right? If you think of this as some auxiliary variable V, this is an OD in eta, okay? 
So integrate twice. Okay? I'm not going to write this, but say, look, if I integrate this once in eta, and here because it's zero, it's, it's going to mean that this, say, let me put it like this. This v is equal to a constant. But it's a constant that depends on c, because I'm integrating it along eta. So you have to write the quote unquote constant in c. And then you integrate it in c, you get another constant. But it will be a constant that depends, quote unquote constant, that depends on eta. So you already get a little bit of a separation of variables. There's a function of xi and a function of eta. Play with it. That's an exercise. Play with it to find, so integrate twice, solve a linear system to get that. No, to get, actually, let me write not that. To get D'Alembert's solution. Which is this. Nice and useful solution, easy to get. You know, do the do the exercise. Okay. Okay. So here I mentioned very quickly the intermediate steps. You should arrive at this, and this is very instructive. Look what happens. First thing. This is left going, and this is a right going wave, right? Look, the initial profile, half of it goes to the left, half of it goes to the right, OK? Let me, le let me release my hand so I can do a little bit of a hand, hand waving here to help. So look at this. Let's go for our first intuitive string playing. Get the string, and this is very cool because look, get the string, boom, and just let it go, right? So if I do this, I get the string and just let it go, g is equal to zero. There's no initial speed. I'm letting it go, there's this displacement, but with initial speed zero, right? So this term is not in the picture, g is zero. So look, this is very nice. If you see a vibrating string, right, in the guitar, bang, you, a vibrating string, it just looks like it's going up and down, but it's very nice that there's a, almost like a synchronization of right and left going modes in a way that we just see it going up and down. Okay? And these modes here, they're sort of, if you look at the Fourier series and think it's a summation, it's a, sum, a Fourier series is a summation. Here now I'm talking to experts. So it's the corridor talking in, in, in the conference, right? We don't write on the board saying, oh, I'm doing this. And you start seeing mathematicians waving their hands. So it's a, it's a sum of signs of different frequencies, right? So for example, look at this. If I get a, a, a string and I just do this, I just pull it up. Right? And I hold it here, and I let it go. This is going to go up and down. Right? But this is going to have a Fourier series transform in signs right? to represent it. It's always 0 here and 0 here. And because it's a linear problem, I can think as a superposition of modes, of Fourier modes. Right? And therefore, so this is already going to be equal 
to two components, this sign and this sign, in a periodic way, one going to the right, another one going to the left. And then there's a high frequency one, right? One going to the right, one going to the left, right? And this dance perfectly synchronized so that we see this guy just going up and down, up and down, up and down, okay? Now, the general solution is this. And then now, I can write something that I think I drew, maybe part of it, in the first class. I don't even remember. Maybe we have to look at the video. I don't even remember if I drew this or not, which is these two pictures here, which are very nice. Time, space, time, space. And the first one is this one. So what am I thinking here? What I'm thinking is, what is the um, region, domain of dependence? <coughs> the other one's going to be the region of influence. The first one I want to do is the domain of dependence of this point, x, t, which means if I'm at position x and at time capital T, what is the information I receive? Which is the domain of dependence? Well, it's this. Look, I have a characteristic plus C and a characteristic minus C, right? Which brings me information. Look, I'm, I'm reading in English. If the lecture was in Portuguese, I would be reading in Portuguese or in Spanish or Chinese. I can't, but, right, I'll be reading in, in the language what the mathematical phrase is telling me. So it's saying, look, values of F here and here will arrive at that guy at, the, at a certain time because of this guy. Now values of G influence this point over this whole interval. So therefore, therefore, the domain of dependence It's this entire closed interval. Is that clear? Right? F, boom, boom. But this guy, you integrate it over that whole region. So look at this. If I change, if I change my data, if I change my data at this point here, it does not affect this point here. And then I say, no, wait a minute. If I'm at point X, I will never feel that the data has been changed here. No, of course I will feel. Just at a, I have to be patient. At a later time, I will feel. Right? But when we say the domain of depends of a point, is a point in space and time. Right? We're talking about the two coordinates, which is space and time. Now, if I think of the region of influence, of say some point x tilde, <coughs> this is what's called the region of influence. A little bit like we saw when I mentioned about the light cone, the monge cone affecting the domain. Okay? So this is the domain of region of influence. So for example, a point here, right? Now mixing the two figures, a point here, its domain of dependence is here. Right? So it is, it will be affected by this point here, right? I'm mixing this figure with that figure. So this is all clearly seen by this expression here. Okay, and um, 
Okay, I mentioned everything I want to mention. And, and uh, 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 an, an interesting exercise, too, that with systems delivery, I think it's, I mean, with both you can do is, for example, if you don't have these boundary conditions here, which I did not put it here, here it's on the entire line, right? There's no boundary conditions in the problem stated like this, right? I just mentioned, I just put these boundary conditions so that we could use our intuition with the string, okay? Now, we can, you see, you can also, you can more or less cook up solutions, try to identify how to, how to find the solution so that you have only a right-going wave, right? To get a solution that you have only the right-going wave, you have to choose the proper speed g so that there's no f going this direction, there's only f going in that direction. And that actually has to do when I get the string, right, with my friend playing the string, I go like this, boom. I only have a wave going that way. We can, you, you can do this at home, right? Get a little piece of string, go like this. Sometimes you only see a string going that way, not going in both directions. Okay, so of course this g, the initial speed, will have to have an information kind of like g has to be, has to have some relation with f, so that when I integrate g, I kill this guy and I stay with this guy, right? So an exercise also. That's not in the notes, but that's an exercise you can do. Very good. Okay, good. Half half an hour. Kind of the timing is good. To now start, I might come. I'm, I will come back to you know, to to waves characteristics at the end, of course, at many times. But I want now to add some elliptic stuff because soon I'll add elliptic with hyperbolic to show some show you some wave problems and so on things which is a little bit similar to what I do in the fluids course. So it's a, there's a part where the inter intersection of the fluids course is non-zero because not everybody takes both courses. Let me erase this. All right, now let's see a little bit of Laplace equation. And as I know, as I think, in a different way from the usual way one learns, Laplace equation, well, but of course some of the things are standard, so I cannot e escape, so I'm not going to use separation of variables, any, anything. I'm going to start producing, cooking up situations where we can use boundary integral formulation, right? So we're going to go to integral equations. So, okay, so let u of x, no, not x, y, sorry. Let's start in Rn. Bc2 in some domain omega. This is omega. This is the normal to the boundary of omega. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the Laplacian, well, let me use the notation, I'm using the notes. Okay, so Laplace's equation is this. Well, together, usually the Laplace form together with boundary conditions. So let omega be some open set where the divergence theorem applies.
right? At some point, we're going to see Laplace uh, domains were actually with, with corners, so piecewise smooth. Okay, no big deal. Um, take u and v in C2, and that's why. Okay, that's why I, ha I didn't write this. Let me erase this. You know why? I'll tell you why. Because for, right, for now, u and v do not satisfy Laplace equation. They're just smooth. Okay, so I, I got ahead of myself writing that. So let's forget that for the time being. And let's say they're smooth even up to the closure, okay? Let's not think about f functions with any, I mean, very friendly functions so we can do the calculations we need all the way to the boundary. And then let looks at, let's start looking at Green's identity. There are many versions of Green's identity. I'm going to show them to you. And sometimes there's one that's called Green's third identity, which is very nice, very useful. So let me start just with Green's identity, which is nothing more than integration by parts using divergence theorem. Okay, so Green's identity yields this. Okay. So basically, the integration by parts is part of the, de the derivatives here. We throw it on v, and we get some boundary term, right? I'll give you more information so that you can sort of deduce this in more detail. Or just think of divergence theorem, too, because this is the divergence of the gradient of v. Okay. And we can also write this in this form. And two forms of interest. Okay. I'll give you, you know, this is just using divergence theorem, monkeying around, playing with divergence theorem. I'll give you information later on. It's in the notes, a few pages down. How do, you, how do you get this? Let me first start discussing with you some, you know, some, some useful things. So the first thing here is <coughs> this is the first use of, like, divergence theorem. If you want, here you can sort of think of using it again. So you throw the other derivatives on V and you get another boundary term, OK? So two versions. And we're going to take advantage of this in many different ways, as you will see, in many different ways. So the first one, one special case. I'll do many different special cases, right? And, one, and some very interesting where we go, we play with information only around the the boundary. That's why it's called the boundary integral formulation. You'll see this. I find this very cool. I like it very much. But let's, let's get our way there. I don't know. Maybe today I'll, I'll talk about this. So the first special case is this. Let v be identically 1. That's a smooth function. No big deal. So if v <coughs> is identically 1 in this version, okay, the bottom version, this is 1. This goes away. This goes away. And this is 1, right? In the sense that then, so let me, 
and then we have that the integral I'm skipping one line, sorry. We have this. Okay. But now, let me show you the usefulness of this. And let me put here on the side. Poisson's equation. What is Poisson's equation? The Poisson problem. One typical case is like this. Okay, my handwriting is not very good, sorry. So in, in, in fluids problems, sometimes this shows up. So what's happening here? So the Poisson problem is that you have a forcing term in the domain. So F acts on in the domain, right? This arrow is just, is just uh, schematic. And du dn is equal to g is actually a flux in the boundary. Okay? So in some, in some fluid problems, whatever, this can be thought a little bit of maybe injecting, or, or if F is negative, injecting or removing fluid, mass, whatever. And the G, right, depending on the sign, the flux out of the domain or into the domain. OK? No big deal. So whatever, elast el electrostatic problems, things that have potential in the similar way. But what that condition says is a condition for at least for us to have a solution. It's a compatibility condition. So this, and this will arrive, arise later on in the course. This is a compatibility condition that says the following. Look. This is equal to F. This is equal to G. And what it says is that I need to have that my integral of F in my domain for a solution to make sense, the integral of F in the domain to be equal to the integral of G on the border, which in some sense is saying, it's a little bit, we can think a little bit of a conservation of mass if we're thinking of fluids or whatever, uh, condition, which think whatever I'm injecting or removing from inside has to be balanced by the flux on the border. So it's a balance of whatever, if it's a fluid thing, what, right? So this is a compatibility condition, right? So if we need to have that. So we already, we already got a useful condition from this Green's identity in a specialized case. And we're going to play with many specialized cases, OK? All right. So just to recall, it's in the notes, right? So divergence theorem. Right? In domains that at least could be, say, Lipschitz domains or piecewise, you know, piecewise um, smooth and so on. I'm not going to get into too much in the details of domains. In our, in our case, at one point in the problem, we're going to see, in, in the course, not in the problem, we're going to see boundaries like this that we allow for corners, right? For so, something that do, does something like this, say. A corner. No big deal. So the divergence theorem.
Is this? Yes. Se eu utilizar, se eu transver outra solução V ali, tem interpretação física simples? If we use, so let me repeat it for the, for the video, if we use different Vs, can we get a different physical interpretation? The answer is yes. I might answer you today, if not, next class. Right? For example, I think next class. But let me anticipate. For example, if you use V, the Green's function of the Laplace equation, we get something very interesting. So don't, don't disappear. Don't miss, don't miss next class, advertisement for the next episode, right, in the series. So don't miss our next episode. I think the next episode, next class or the other one, but soon, OK? So yes, choices of V are interesting. You can play with that, OK? So see, if you put the divergence thing like this, this gives that, and then plain, like it's in the notes, but right, plain with this, you get these expressions I showed before if they were not familiar to you for the first time. OK? So let's leave it at that. And it's in the notes, right? So you get the notes. You can check it. You can do it as an exercise and then, and then check it. <coughs> OK. Another case of, of Green's identity. Now, let me, how could I announce this now? now Take the case where u is equal to v. So you were asking me, can I use other v's to get something interesting? Well, I announced something more spectacular, which is the Green's function. But still, we have it's useful if, if you just take, wait, let me take u equal to v. And remember <coughs> that here, there are not solutions of uh, Laplace equation yet. It's just smooth function. Which, with, with which I can play, OK? So if I use this, uh, then Green's identity becomes becomes this, OK? And let me mention something. Well, let me see here. We have usually in Laplace equation. Now let's go to Laplace equation. And actually, when we do potential theory, right? Potential theory is usually when we have a potential. We're going to do this in water waves where Right? We have, say, a conservative field where we have a potential, which is the gradient of the potential is the field. Okay? So Laplace equation has, and this comes up in fluids, has two classical problems. We have the Dirichlet problem and the Neumann problem. The Dirichlet problem is we're going to write actually the the, the Neumann uh, the, sorry the Poisson equation and the Neumann problem. Okay, 
So these are two typical problems where basically we have a function. The Dirichlet problem is that we have the function value along the border. And the Neumann problem, we have the flux, right? The normal derivative sort of along the border. This expression here, right, which I'll give it another name, like another number, since I'm not keeping track of numbers like square with a cross. This expression here, which I have to move to another board, is useful to prove uniqueness of these problems. Let's see how that goes. So you see, again, I'm using Green's identity, and as you were asking me, playing with V, I get different versions of the Green's identity, which are useful for different cases. So it's got uniqueness of solutions. So let's do this. So suppose we have <coughs> Laplacian U1 equal to W, and also Laplacian of U2 equal to W. OK, so suppose we have two solutions. And let me complete here, which I didn't write, for the same boundary data. Dirichlet or be it Neumann. Okay? So therefore, we have this. Because the problem is linear, let me, let me do this a little better. So, For the Dirichlet case, we have this. For the Neumann case, is the derivative will be equal to zero. Okay, so from we have that. So we have that this is equal to 0, which implies uniqueness. So the, in the notes, I say check. Well, look, if this is equal to 0, these are all positive terms. So all of them have to be 0, right? And say, OK, maybe these guys then differ by a constant. No, but it can't because, boom, it's 0. Okay, so this is for the Dirichlet case. Uniqueness, say, of Dirichlet. And for the Neumann case, I also mentioned here just in the notes, is for the Neumann case, uniqueness is up to a constant. So Neumann case, uniqueness is 
up to a constant. But if we're solving for a potential, so for the case of potential theory, where uv is gradient of phi and you have this type of situation the constant does not matter, right? Because this, in the fluids problem, this appears. You know, a problem like this will appear. We're, we're actually, you're going to see something along these lines. So if I need to find the potential phi, this means that the normal velocity of the potential, see, look, gradients, I'm put it like you, so it's even more obvious what, what I'm talking about. So this is, normal speed, and there's some fluid problems. Just think of this like a lake, right? We're at the boundary. This is impermeable. So there's no flow, no flow across the boundary, right? No flow across the boundary because it's impermeable, right? Or in a container, fluid in a container. So. If the fluid in the container, there's no flow, this is what it means, no flow, right? I solve the Neumann problem, and I have uniqueness, according to this, I have uniqueness up to a constant. But who cares, right? If I have this, or I have that, it's just, Right, there's renormalization, whatever you want to call it, of the level curve, but the flow is the same. And that's what I'm interested in. I want to find the potential. So in some problems, this constant does not matter. But technically speaking, from the PDE's point of view, the uniqueness using this of the Neumann problem is up to a constant. OK. Now, yes, I'm about to start computing, or deducing, sorry, the Green's function for Laplace's equation, OK? So since I have a few minutes, I'm not going to do it. Let me just prepare for next class. Let me just say, what, what are we going to do? So let me check with you. Do you know when I talk about the Green's function for Laplace's equation, does that mean anything for you? Or no, it's a novelty or a Green's function for some, from some differential operator? Yeah, I learned it from undergrad. You learned it from undergrad, yes. Yeah, some, some and we learn in ODs, we learn sometimes with Laplace's equation, um, with Laplace transforms, how to deal with it. But it's basically, what we're, we're going to see, let me write this here, what we're going to see so since I have like, say, I will use a few minutes of these last five minutes, is this. We're going to have a domain, right? And formally speaking, formally speaking, the Green's function, G, satisfies this, the Dirac delta Dirac function. And basically it means if I have a singularity here, how does the whole domain sort of reacts, informally speaking, to this singularity here. If I put at some point x bar, right? We're going to deduce the Green's function for in n dimensions. And in two dimensions, the Green's function is just going to be log of r, OK, times some constant. And using the Green's function, we're going to see something very interesting. 
is that using the Green's function, a boundary integral formulation of our problem. And actually, I'm going to show to you that if I do a line integral along this contour like this, I can write u of x as a line integral, say in 2D, over the boundary, okay, a line integral of something here that depends on the Dirichlet data, plus something that depends on the Neumann data, Yes. Right? Which is only, look, only over the boundary. So this is very cool, which means if I know the Dirichlet data and the Neumann data on the boundary, I know everything inside where x is in omega. So this is a boundary integral formulation. The problem is that you cannot impose Dirichlet and Neumann data arbitrarily. And I'm going to then show to you, using another version, as I mentioned, many playing around with the Green's identity, I'm going to show you that actually you can write an equation to get one from the other. That means you cannot, you cannot impose one and impose the other. But if you solve the problem and you know that both data, you're done. You can then just by computing this integral over the contour, know the value of the solution inside without ever having to get inside, say. Okay? So we'll see this next, and now I almost use all of my minutes. Okay? So we can finish here.